Okay, thank you very much for joining today. And this is the second webinar of the HEC UCA International School Media Communications and Development in Modern World. And today we have a very excellent speaker, uh, Professor Ilya Kiria. He is uh, the head of the School of Media. He is Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Communications, Media and Design. Uh, he also the head of international relations at the faculty, and he is responsible for scientific activities of the faculty. And he is the head of the laboratory for media research. That's if you have any questions, uh, his professional interest, political economy of mass communications, theories of information and communications, and social history of communication technologies. That's, uh, you can ask uh, any questions um, in our chat. And today's topic, uh, political economy of communications, contemporary issues on cultural industry. And I'm giving the floor to the professor. Thank you, Ekaterina. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, despite uh, pandemic, despite uh, time distanciation and space distanciation, and thank you for joining us. So uh, <clears throat> I will try to start the presentation. I hope it will work. Yeah, uh, it seems to be okay right now. Mm. Just a moment, I will start launch the presentation itself. Okay, like that. Can you see my presentation? Everything is okay? Yes. Uh, okay, good, very good. Okay, so let's start. Um, so I, I has been brilliantly introduced by Yekaterina, so I will probably not spend your time on that. Uh, I will but say to you that we just opened this year the English speaking program on critical media studies, which is a master program and especially the content which I will give you today is one of the one of the, I will say, subject of the discussion on this program where I'm piloting the political economy track. So we have three main tracks on this critical media studies program. We have a track on critical issues on text and analysis. We have a track on political economy of communication and we have the track of uh, the cultural analysis. So, okay, let's start. Um, so, uh, so uh, this is a summary of today's presentation. Of course, I will try to organize it the way to give you the, the, the time for questions and answers. So uh, for Q and A sessions, uh, so, uh, so um, initially I will speak, uh, at the beginning, uh, I will speak about um, the theory of cultural industries. Uh, it will be quite short, concise theoretical review of it. Uh, secondly, I will try to show you main changes of the cultural industries in the contemporary digital world. Uh, and especially uh, I will focusing on the what I call enlarging industrialization. So in my opinion, we are actually, we can observe more and more cultural industries which are included into the industrial realm of the contemporary commodified media economy. And finally, um, I will try to show the changing market power aspect. So. Uh, I will try to show how the IT companies and uh, uh, 
telecommunication companies are more and more increasingly present in the media segment and are trying to uh, make the huge market power in this uh, particular field. Yeah. So cultural industries, first of all, yeah, I'm referring to political economy approach. And uh, of course, at the beginning, I have to define it. Yeah? The central point of political economy of communication is uh, the uh, question of the inequality and dominance in field of access to the information and culture in field of access to means of self-expressions, etc. So the political economy deals with any different kinds of abuses of power, uh, different forms of power, every world. Yeah. So uh, political economy of communication deals with a study how communication goods are unequally produced, unequally distributed across the society, and which, of course, generating a lot of different kind of abuses. Yeah. So, um, of course, the why finally I prefer this approach. I'm working on political economy field during probably last twenty years, or at, at least twenty years. Yeah. Uh, so why finally media deals with, with the power? In my opinion, yeah, it's, it's quite simple to represent. What, the media is just a self-expression, yeah. So uh, uh, in my opinion, it's not just a self-expression. Media is a form of power. Communication is a form of power because it frames human interaction, which affects all institutions of the society. And especially here, I'm referring to John Thompson model of four modes of power, four types of power. Economic power, which relies on economic resources. Political power, which uh, relies on legitimate violence. Coercive power, which uh, relies on military forces, etc. And symbolic power, which relies on media and culture. And especially right now, in contemporary societies, we can see how the symbolic power uh, becomes more and more important in the modern, in the modern world. Yeah? Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's very important thing. Yes, of course, in the primitive form, primitive, primitive form of the state, in early states, we can see that economic power and cursive power played the hugest role, the most important one. Yeah, so in a most primitive societies, traditional societies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, in feudal societies, for example, the coercive power was major power, uh, and uh, it was related, uh, of course, uh, with the ability to have a big military troops, uh, armed forces, uh, which finally um, built all kind of legitimacy. Uh, of course, the contemporary world is a pretty, pretty complicated, just because in contemporary world we can see the coercive power is uh, less present, while the political power uh, and uh, especially the symbolic power uh, becomes much more uh, bigger. So the power of symbolic actually, in my opinion, is a decisive power, just because any political things are related with symbolic power. Any political things are related with the ability to control media, ability to control symbolic institutions, uh, ability to control the ideology production field. And when we speak about ideology production field, you should understand that this is a very, very large domain. Yeah. So, and of course, symbolic power is in. Uh, particular way structuring also our political relations, our economic relations, et cetera, et cetera. A symbolic power becomes very, very important in a contemporary world. So, um, of course, um, of course, uh, the problem is that in contemporary world, we have deal with the victory of commercial media. So it means that in the contemporary world, nobody questions the, the, the idea that uh, in contemporary capitalism, media and especially media company or media related businesses are very, very interconnected. 
and produce a very huge amount of money uh, under that classical cap capitalistic principle of the capital accumulation. Yeah. So uh, it's just it's quite old, quite old uh, map. It's a map uh, which was drawn by by Arsino and uh, Manuel Castells around ten years ago. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, it uh, illustrates well how the companies in the field of mass media, such as CBS, such as NBC, such as uh, um, Time Warner, so companies uh, mainly active, active in field of news production, in field of uh, media coverage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are interconnected with the companies. Uh, from internet fields such as Yahoo or, Go or Google, uh, as well as with companies uh, manufacturing devices. Yeah, we can see here Microsoft, we can see here Walt Disney, we can see here Apple just in the center. Yeah, uh, so it means that yes, we have deal with a very, very dominant field field which is uh, largely dominated by the big corporations uh, and uh, mainly such corporations are still global. Yeah? So means that we can observe a strong connection between sector of cultural industries, so movie industry, music industry, sector of non-industrial entertainment such as performing arts, etc., sector of telecommunication, sector of IT such as device manufacturing, Sector, sector of gaming industry, sector of sport industry, we can see that uh, a lot of clubs, uh, soccer clubs or some other, are uh, more or less owned by big telecommunication companies, sometimes by big media companies, uh, etc. Sector of mass media, sector of software industry, sector of IT representing not device manufacturing, but the platforms such as uh, YouTube, such as Google, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So uh, it's a hugely interconnected thing, and of course, uh, of course, on a basis of such huge diversity of media channels, of media companies, uh, of media owners, etc., uh, a lot of people in field of science, in field of analysis, uh, etc. Uh, I've had a lot of illusions about that. So, of course, uh, such illusions, uh, if you want, are the pillars of the contemporary system of the capitalism media industries. Yeah. Uh, first illusion is that supply and demand are the perfect way to regulate exchange relationship in the field of culture, including democratic representation, balance. Uh, uh, between uh, uh, role of media in the political system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So the idea that we don't need to regulate the media market anymore just because uh, it's a it's just a marketplace of idea. Yeah. You know that marketplace of idea was a central dream of the uh, thinkers and philosophers during last uh, probably three hundred years since John Stuart Mill, uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, and, uh, and some other uh, people. Yeah? Second illusion is that digital world provided the equal possibility to express points of view, to express opinions, etc., because digital world deals with what we call actually the, the ability to express opinion, uh, the ability to, 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 to a lot of tools of self-expression, such as YouTube, etc. You can, it's amazing, you can do everything you want, you can place any kind of content uh, on the uh, proprietary platforms or open access platforms, etc. And it's amazing and it's good because it's a real equal possibilities to each people to uh, express their point of view. Third illusion is that digital platforms and technologies are neutral and per itself contribute to the modernization of the society, to the social development, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the illusion that new platforms are just empowering the user and, and depowering the big corporations, just because uh, we as users obtained a lot of power, obtained the possibility to post everything, to, to, 
to produce any content to make this content familiar to any people. So, uh, and of course, uh, there are a lot of mythologies about that. Yeah. So, today I will try to show you that probably uh, such impression are quite false. And of course, that uh, they are based on non-critical vision of the media. Yeah. Uh, why to be critical? Uh, just we can just compare two sets of, of questions, such as, for example, who uses social media? Why are they used? What are the most popular social media? How can a company make profit by crowdsourcing work in social media, etc.? And then another set of questions: How does commodification work in field of social media? Do you know what is a commodification? Commodification is a process of uh, transformation of any um, of any uh, use value of any kind of activity into the commodity. So commodity sold into the market, yeah, sold into the commercial market, yeah. So we know that not all human relationship, not all human interactions can be sold on the market, and not all human interactions can be commodified or should be probably commodified. Uh, second. For example, the question why the commodification of social media is problematic. Why finally the commodification of social media creates particular inequalities? For example. In what way is the labor of user on social media exploited? Yeah, and the question of the digital exploitation right now is quite popular. And finally, are there any alternatives to the commercial social media? Can we, can we think about it? So, uh, so it means that critical approach means that we are we should be critical against positivism, and assumption that any kind of theory is a value free. Uh, we should also be structural. We should also take a look on a structure of things and take a look on a very complex phenomena, uh, and not just ex examining very very narrow things, uh, uh, et cetera, we should uh, try to, uh, to watch larger things and to observe them as scientifics, as uh, researchers, etc. And finally, critical approach deals with how humans who live in structure of domination reproduce them, how humans without thinking about them, how ordinary users with, without thinking about Capital, big corporations, advertising money, etc., are just reproducing the situation in which they are dominated by the large corporation power. So, first of all, we will let's refer to the theory of cultural industries. Yeah, because uh, we will speak about cultural industries initially, and um, I have to 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 stand on that. So, what is industrialization of culture? Industrialization of culture shouldn't be confused with the process of commercialization because process of commercialization or marketization is much more broad. Uh, what is industrialization of culture? They are basic characteristic of industrialization. They are two. First, technical reproduction of the product on the basis of zero copy, master copy. So uh, historically, we uh, called as cultural industries, a field of culture, which was created ab around technical reproduction of the product on the basis of zero copy. For example, music phonographic industry. Music phonographic industry means that you are just taking the zero copy of the disc and you are just stamping it and uh, reproducing, technically reproducing, yeah? Uh, or the movie industry, the same, yeah? You are making available simultaneously the content of the film, the, well, say, uh, the film uh, to the few hundred different uh, movie theaters, yeah? So this is the industrial production of culture. So historically industrial production of culture was a movie industry, was music industry, 
tonographic industry, book industry, etc. Uh, but for example, not theater, not theater. And it's understandable why, because theater never has been the really industrialized way of production. So it's in a some particular point of view, it's a craft production. Just because in a theater, each time the troops is coming to the scene and playing, performing the, 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 you know, the performance. So uh, in this case, it's not industrialized. It's not reproducible technically act. Second basic characteristics of the industrialization is a non-material content diffused via telecommunication network. Of course, in the contemporary world, we have deal with immaterial reproduction, but it's still a reproduction because it makes the content available simultaneously to the infinite number of people. Yeah, when I'm, when I'm just opening my Apple TV, I can buy any film and it's av available simultaneously to a millions of people or even billions so it created this historical uh, distinction between industrialized culture and non-industrialized culture the non-industrial production of culture it's the plastic arts painting theatrical performance etc yeah so because it's what we call the craft production what is a painting? How can you technically reproduce paintings? Yes, you can copy paintings, but you know that the copying paintings is just to make the new painting. And, and you know that uh, sometimes the prices of such copies are quite, quite high because this is a manual work. It's not technically reproducible. Of course, you can take the paint, painting Mona Lisa, let's say, you can make a photo of it and put it into the book. But in this case, it will be not the painting as a part of the industrial culture. It will be a book industry. So it's created such kind of their division between non-industrial production and industrialized production and cultural industries which was based on the three main pillars, such as recorded music, so phonographic industry, movie industry, uh, and uh, of course, the book industry, but, uh, or publishing. But of course, uh, actually quasi all media are more or less related with it because television is also industrial production. Television became a very huge uh, way or channel of distribution of the cultural production. So, of course, uh, the theory of cultural industries refers to the editorial function. They call it editorial function. Yeah? Editorial function is just the articulating of two things, of technical reproduction and distribution of the, uh, of the uh, creative content and creative process. Creative process, uh, which is... Uh, personally driven, uh, based on idea, immaterial, um, immeasurable, etc. So, and the editorial functions, which is mainly played by large companies, uh, editor is bringing together the artistic or creative side and commercial reproduction of the, of the uh, art, yeah? Uh, this is the case of the movie makers, such as big uh, movie majors in the field of cinema, or big phonographic companies uh, such as uh, Sony or BMG or etc. Uh, so this is the function of the big corporations in the editorial function. They are just providing the technical facilities and ensuring the needed marketing in order to make creative process available to people. It was a historical function of the editorial process. So. Theoretical foundations of cultural industry is based on uh, mainly two approaches. First of all, it's a Frankfurt School. Yeah? The theory of the idea of industrialization of culture, the idea of transformation of the culture, uh, of, the, uh, of the art into the commodity, into the marketplace, 
into the uh, markets uh, sales of ideas etc uh, has been formulated by uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Orkheimer uh, in uh, the um, uh, of course in the dialectics of enlightenment uh, uh, the book uh, which has been published uh, I think in 47 so uh, and of, of course, uh, the, this idea, this critical, especially critical um, uh, interpretation of this process of industrialization of culture, of the uh, loose of the culture, of the aura, so the particular uniqueness of the artistic creation, uh, has been a center of this discussion, of this scientific discussion of the critical school or the Frankfurt school, so-called. Second direction is, of course, the political economy of communication, and especially such people as Dallas Smart and Herbert Schiller. So, uh, because uh, both uh, saw that uh, uh, more and more involvement of most dynamic sectors of financial and industrial capitalism into the industries of mass communication and culture can be observed. So, we can see the phenomena of concentration of media companies, transnational media companies, multimedia companies, et cetera, et cetera. And it means that actually uh, the big media corporations is just a center of the contemporary capitalism. Take a look, Microsoft is a media company. Sorry, but Apple also is a media company. Apple is not only producing iPhones. Apple is a company which is manufacturing content also, yeah? So, of course, the contemporary theories of cultural industry started a little bit later, especially in 1970s with mostly French and partly British schools. And uh, the reason of the appearance is quite simple. Um, in 1970s, we can see first politics in Europe in field of commercialization and privatization or partly privatization of the state-owned media. So it opened or reopened the debate about uh, the deregulation, and of course, some critically speaking scholars, some scholars coming from Marxist or cultural studies, or especially uh, um, political economy of communication, tried to question this, uh, well, say, uh, progressive, uh, progressive move of the state out of the culture, yeah out of the cultural identities, out of the cultural regulation, yeah. Uh, so um, this uh, history of the contemporary theory of cultural industry is based on the uh, basic works of French school. It's especially some works by Bernard Mies, Alain Huet, Patrice Flichy in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and the main principle of cultural industry and industrialization of culture, which I already try to, to, to express you uh, right, uh, right a couple of slides before. Uh, so uh, has been formulated in such, publi in such publications. And within British neo-Marxist, especially uh, Graham Murdoch, which is just in the center here on the picture, and uh, Nicholas Garnham, uh, which is just, uh, we can see in a green t-shirt, in a, in, a, in a green t-shirt, yeah. So on a, on a, on a right, uh, close to the right corner of this picture. And then finally, we can see some new logics in 2000s when due, due to the internet, due to the development of ICT, information communication technologies, uh, a lot of schoolers try to include the, these digital transformation into the domain of the cultural industries, uh, into the domain of the change of cultural industries. Yeah? So right now, let's focus on the main changes in the digital world of this picture. So the problem is quite simple. The old world was based on the idea of high level of power um, of so-called gatekeepers. So it means that the old world was based uh, on a proprietary idea that there are no ideas which can circulate in a public domain without gatekeepers. So you need a particular gatekeeper in order to make your idea familiar to the any people. Yeah, 
and such gatekeepers was publishing company, radio stations, television company, movie makers, uh, music productions, etc., etc. And of course, this old world was based on the idea of this proprietary field. And of course, such companies what was not so so so, so uh, how to say it was quite concentrated. So uh, there are quite low number of such companies in the market. And of course, it means that uh, this field of gatekeepers commercially mainly commercially working gatekeepers uh, uh, was the main basic principle of this old world we call it old world uh, of the uh, of the cultural industries of course the new world is much more complicated and of course this new world uh, gave to some political economists especially liberal political economists of communications um, uh, for example, such as Benjamin Campaign or Eli Noam or some others, uh, gave them the, the, the legitimacy to say that, yeah, in the contemporary world, media are more, com are more competitive just because there are no, not only big corporations, because the user is empowered, because user can do what, what he wants more or less. Uh, because any kind of idea can be accessible to people more or less directly from the author to the audience without any particular gatekeeper, without any particular publishing company, without any particular television company, without any particular movie industry uh, production, etc., etc. Yeah. So um, it means that the old world was based on a high level of power among distributors and of cultural industries, while today we can see a high variety of this uh, different alternative way of um, uh, communication between author and the audience. And it, me it means that we have deal with a um, fantastic, we'll say, um, liberation uh, of the authorship. Uh, authors became totally independent from the big production companies, etc., because they can produce themselves, they can just make music and put it into the YouTube and uh, commercialize it via crowdsourcing platforms, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, this uh, gatekeeping should be considered as a in much more broader sense today. So, uh, because uh, yes, they in the old world, this idea of gatekeeping uh, referred to quite simple model model in which any idea should 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 bypass a particular filter of the gatekeepers in order to be familiar to people, to be published, to be spread out. But today, gatekeeping is much more complicated because gatekeeping could be regarded as a high market power of any kind of the uh, companies. And today we can see that gatekeeping is progressively moving from one particular kind of actors to another particular kind of actors, especially to the platform. We call them the platform. And you know that uh, the, the, this uh, uh, quite known book, The Capitalism of the Platforms, a platform capitalism. Yeah. The idea that uh, finally uh, gatekeeping uh, function is not only to uh, control the content itself, it's also to control the packaging of this content. It's also to control how the algorithm, how this content becomes visible to people. And of course, it's especially digital platforms which are controlling such fields. It's a, for example, and we can see actually this gatekeeping function rising in such fields as taxi services, tourism, medical care, university, because we can see that all such kind of market power placed in a, in a platform. Yeah, the taxi services are connecting just transport companies with the clients and we have deal with Uber. Uh, we can see in field of tourism, it's just connecting hotels and air companies with the customers. Uh, in medical care, just connecting doctors with the clients, and finally university connecting professors with students, and especially you know, of course, the rise of the contemporary uh, MOOCs, uh, mass open online courses, uh, so which uh, simultaneously gives 
the, the access to the content of the course and to the professors to a much more larger, broader audience than just the university. So it means that actually gatekeeping companies are progressively replaced by mediatized platforms and gatekeepers are under the market dominance of technological companies, device manufacturers, telecommunication operators. So it means that the nature of competition is changing, but we are still in the world of gatekeepers. It's another kind of gatekeepers and we have deal uh, with the different changes in the relationship of gatekeeping. Uh, of course, we can see new products rising with this kind of platform transformation. So we can see immaterial service providing the informational access to particular persons, goods, etc., such as searching engines. But uh, we can see the importance of the ad advising role and the uh, new gatekeeping role of the organization, such as storage, classification, search, etc. And from this point of view, the market power of such companies as search engines, such as Google, is rising drastically. So, uh, of course, at the same time, it's a development of social exchange, just connecting people between them, allowing them to diffuse different information, share self-productive content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and uh, it's a kind of general trends. We are just transforming goods into the services. We are just transforming goods into the continuum services, uh, into the account, into the constant connection between us, ourselves, and the uh, and the capitalist companies. And of course, uh, we can see a kind of new products appearing in this field also. So we have deal with a large replacement of the proper property by the access. We can see, and this is especially well described in the book of Jeremy Rifkin, Age of Access. Yeah, uh, he's just trying to say how they, in contemporary capitalism, the uh, good is less and less related to us by relationship of property but much and much is much is related with us by the relationship of access. We can see a lot of services just based on the access, not based on the entire buying something, but just giving an access to this. Yeah? For example, instead of buying a car, we can just make an access to the car and we can use a car sharing. This is a, just the replacement of this relationship of property by the relationship of the access. And of course, the digital access especially is changing this model just because we have deal the, with a permanent connection between provider of service and the user. And take a look on our smartphones, we can see that we are totally connected with our stores, with a different kind of services, with the taxi services, with the Google, with the Apple TV, et cetera, et cetera. So it means that uh, we are at a constant direct connection with uh, companies selling us something. Before it was not like this. Before we has been connected with a company, with a store, for example, just in the period when we just physically came to this store, actually we are connected always because we have a digital marketplace of this store. Sometimes we opening it, we are just browsing it, etc., etc. Yeah. So we have deal with the access. The third, third thing is just enlarging industrialization. So this idea that the more and more broader and broader cultural fields or cultural domains becomes commodified is one of my central idea. Uh, why? Just because actually we can see the industrialization of the cultural domains, which probably 20 years ago hasn't been considered as a mediatized and as they, uh, how to say it, industrialized. For example, 
uh, how how such kind of industrialization came just through the uh, individualization of cultural practices. We can see uh, that some new products which before never has been considered as a part of cultural industries actually are more and more considered as. For example, the, 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 the field in, in field of dramatic art, we can see some domains of theater which start to be industrialized increasingly. It's, for example, the domain of musicals. Musical is an absolutely standard production, yeah? Because musical is a licensed production. In the, in the musical Mamma Mia, the same music is played across all the world, yeah? Because it's uh, protected by the copyright laws, etc., etc. And uh, we can see some other forms of the making the theatrical performances more available to larger masses of people, uh, etc. It's such as kind of as music festivals, for example. Uh, yeah, they, when a huge part of them is organized conjointly by media and phonographic industry in order to promote tracks, to promote new groups, to promote artists, etc. So we can see how finally the parts of the culture, of the cultural market, which previously hasn't been industrialized, actually become more and more industrialized or reproducible. The same field is the education. Education also has been considered by, as a part of cultural industries, or at least as a, one of the cluster of it. And uh, we can see how right now this field is increasingly industrialized, especially via blended learning, distant education, mass open online courses. And of course, uh, we can see how big technological companies are uh, increasingly investing into this field. Uh, of course, we can uh, see the um, industrialization of different forms of amateurism. So we can see that the proliferation of the platforms of UGC, user-generated content such as YouTube, for example, made some forms of amateurism industrialized. Before, such kind of things never has been considered as industry, but actually it's still the industry because it's reproducible, it's available simultaneously to the millions of people. So it's accessible through platform to the large amount of people. And uh, of course, we can see crowdfunding platforms or crowdfunding models or advertising based, basic, based models as drivers of this process. So it drives the people to, to produce more, to, to, to do that. Um, of course, the same with the individualization. Of course, uh, this process is a very old thing. We can start this process just from the, uh, from the, from the early cultural practices, from the uh, using of individual piano in the saloons of the end of the 19th century. But then we can see as increasingly uh, media become absolutely individual practices. Today, we are consuming media more and more alone. Yeah, not only in the car, but on our smartphones, in the public transportations, uh, etc. in the kitchens, uh, some, some people in toilets in DC, uh, etc. So of course, this fragmentation of tastes and practices, which has been driven by this technological innovation, of course, created a large number of individual electronic devices. And you know that, for example, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was a kind of meat. And it, this meat was very, very uh, supported by uh, some uh, kind of people from IT industry, especially Bill Gates. Uh, the meat that finally in the future, we will have just one main media device yeah, uh, which we will use all to the to to to, to obtain the information to make an individual entertainment, etc. Uh, if we will take a look on that uh, on the on this uh, thing published just probably in the beginning of 2000 and then, uh, end of 1990s, uh, Bill Gates said that this kind of device will be PC TV, 
personal computer television, PC TV, so, so the kind of hybrid of the PC and TV. So we can see that it's not true. We can see that the era of personal consumption, actually we are in the era, in the middle of the era of personal consumption and personal devices. The number of devices is just growing. The number of the connected devices is growing in the world just because the smartphone didn't became this universal gadget. We are still using the TV, especially smart TV. Yeah, uh, Tablet PC is not dying anymore just because tablet PC also occupied a very important place. But actually we can see a rise of another kind of connected devices, yeah? The number of functions in there is growing. Number of connected devices is still growing. Multifunctionality doesn't lead to the reduction of the number of devices. We can see absolutely, we can do absolutely anything on a laptop computer, on a tablet PC, on a smartphones, but we still prefer to have separately laptop TV, smartphone, and tablet PC. So of course, it's creation, cre creating a kind of the, uh, the, the relationship uh, in this triad of between device, network, and content creates a kind of fragmentation and destandardization, yeah? We can see different ways, yeah? Uh, of course, uh, another thing is that uh, cultural industries and media industries are just enlarging. They are just enlarging because, because we can see a huge drastical mediatization of everything. We can see uh, the thing we, some, some people are calling them the Googleization of the information segment. Yeah? So it's the domination of very na narrow number of films on the market which is mistakenly considered as open access based, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, and of course we can uh, see a uh, logics of the online games used in this uh, scenario, used in the commercialization of such uh, platforms, but the number of such platforms is just growing because we can see how in our everyday life today, uh, progressively more and more things are mediatized. It's especially, you take a look at how during the last 10 years, transport practices has been mediatized because actually a lot of people are just can't, can't, can't navigate in the city without the media, uh, media devices, devices which, which, which are providing the possibility to find itinerary, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? The transport practices. The sport and health practices also, yeah? The trackers, different kind of trackers, different built in into mobile devices to separate, yeah, et cetera. So they are just making, transforming the individual practice of sport into collective practice, whether result, results could be comparable, shared instantly, et cetera. And especially it's my explication why much more people actually are doing the the running, why actually the running became very popular sport. Just because today we have technological devices which makes our social interaction during runnings, but especially after it, the sharing of results, of sportive results, etc., instantly and very, uh, very uh, easy. So uh, we can see the platformization of the ordinary practices. For example, we know that this platform was quite popular around three years ago in Moscow, in Russia, where this is a platform of the, uh, of the just ordering the cooking. So you are just ordering the particular uh, alimentation. Uh, you are just uh, uh, ordering, for example, the particular alimentation, which you can bring together and prepare at home. Um, but uh, you are just taking the menu on the application and actually we have deal with the age of applications and we are using the menu for the week and the platform are just organizing the shipment of all ingredients to you and you are just cooking yourself. Yeah? It's much more easier than just to go to the market and think how much 
how much potato I need for the soup or something like that. Yeah. So it's just a platformization of such kind of relationship. And we can see how in Greece increasingly uh, everything is platformized actually in a, in a or uberized. Yeah. The uberization of the economy. Of course, we have deal with another phenomenon, the rise of IT in the media segment. Yeah, the rise of big corporations of the information industries into the media. Since everything becomes platforms and uh, more and more things are mediatized through the platforms, uh, IT and telecommunication industries becomes more and more visible in media segment. Yeah? If we take a look on the main periods of the concentration in cultural industry, we can see that at the beginning, it was a horizontal concentration. So merging businesses, familiar businesses, yeah, businesses in the field of press, for example, in newspaper, just in order to, to obtain more uh, market shares. Then we have deal with the two kind of diagonal concentration. The first diagonal concentration was a concentration uh, merging press companies with the television companies. We call them multimedia companies and just merging electronic companies with cultural industries, yeah, uh, with production of the featured content. Then the second stage came uh, just uh, on a basis, and especially after the uh, um, after the dot com bull. Uh, uh, it's a merging of media and cultural industries with telecom com com companies and telecommunication companies, yeah, such as our time Warner Fusion. Uh, Etc. Fusion of between uh, uh, Time Warner, Time Warner Cable, uh, etc. And finally, the third was the diagonal concentration is emerging media and cultural industries with IT company. It's especially the uh, especially the thing we can observe right now in the industry. Of course, uh, another reason is very simple: is a deregulation. Because starting from 1970s, in a few European markets, private company has been allowed to own terrestrial broadcasting. Yeah. And of course, it's proliferated the large amounts of different kind of distribution companies, uh, especially private owned companies such as Biscay B in UK uh, or uh, Comcast in U U US, etc. So, and especially in Europe, the television became a huge part for the concentration. Uh, and of course, uh, represented a very, very uh, important point of interest for the big commercial companies. Yeah. Then we can see a turn of electronic companies which penetrated this area. Especially, we can see such fusion sets, a fusion of Matsushita. So, Matsushita, so the Panasonic acquired Universal Studios in 1990. Mm, so, then Universal Studios has been. By, uh, by Seagram and uh, finally by uh, Vivendi Universal. And actually Universal Studio, as you know, is owned by Comcast um, or Sony. Sony acquired in uh, 89 Columbia Pictures, American big major and MGM, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Yeah? Uh, well, Sony and Panasonic is a mainly Japanese company and mainly concentrated in the field of device manufacturing. Yeah? Then, then we can see a turn of telecommunication companies. We can see a fusion of Time Warner with America Online in, uh, I think, in, two, in 1999, something like that. Uh, or Comcast, for example, which finally acquired NBC Universal around five years ago. So, of course, it created the new players in this field. Uh, we can see how media are progressively merging with e-commerce company. And it's quite simple, sim simple, it's understandable because actually we can see how media is progressively becoming a marketplace. Sorry, but Instagram is just a marketplace. You are opening Instagram, it's became a platform which uh, uh, actually helps you to buy things. So. Uh, of course, uh, such kind of market power creates a particular capitalist ambitions for the media companies to acquire the e-commerce companies. 
uh, another thing we can see merging of media with sport companies, which is also understandable because sport actually in a big, uh, in big sport, especially soccer, etc. Uh, the biggest part of the revenues of the clubs is the media, is the just selling rights for broadcasting of the uh, tournaments, etc., etc. So from this point of view, it's understandable also. Then we can see how media and cultural industry progressively became dependent from financial sector. Because media and cultural industry, especially around 20 years ago, became very popular and very speculated assets on the financial markets. Yeah. And finally, the actual turn of cultural industries dependent from platforms such as Google, iTunes, etc. The distributional platforms actually obtain a huge market powers and uh, obtain the ability to control this field. Um, so, and of course, the digital world become a platform dependent. So we can see how particular services could be used only or jointly only by particular devices. We can see this huge uh, dependence, technological dependence of the iTunes uh, from uh, iOS systems. So from this point of view, you cannot use iTunes and iOS, iOS or Apple TV on, for example, non-Apple devices, while you can't use a Google uh, or all services of Google in the non-Android device. So it became the kind of proprietary platform development. Yeah? So what is next? Of course, my opinion is that we can see uh, how uh, more bigger sectors are involved into this game of mediatization just because uh, they are merging with a more broader range of industries with medicine, with especially education, with financial sector, elementary, etc. You know that uh, probably some of you who are in Russian context know that around one month ago or a couple of months ago, Sberbank, Russian biggest state player in the field of financial market, announced that it is not the bank anymore. It is the universal um, platform of everything because actually you can use a Sber, uh, Sber bank or Sber, uh, how we call it today, for a lot of things. Uh, for for example, shipment, uh, uh, Sber market is a, just a kind of platform which allow you to um, to uh, to buy things on a stores and to ship it into your home. Uh, so we can see how Sber is uh, increasingly presented in the field of transportation with the city mobile, uh, how it's increasingly presented in the field of the, uh, of the uh, entertainment uh, with the Sber card, for example, and, uh, and some and other digital services, etc. So it means that in medicine, in education, in financial sector, in elementary, in uh, retail, it will be increasingly presented. And uh, of course, we can see right now some global practices owners, uh, especially uh, coming from American market, but not only. Uh, and uh, we can see how such companies are just trying to include everything inside. First, it's Amazon, of course. We can see that Amazon have their particular entertaining studios. So we have Amazon Studios. Amazon is not, is not just a retailing business. Amazon is making movies. Yeah, they have their own studios. At the same time, Amazon is very developing in field of education, Amazon education. Amazon at the same time, uh, retaining his own paying or financial platform, Amazon Pay, and is very active in field of the non-driving non-driver cars so self-driving cars yeah their project aws especially uh, can be mentioned the same or similar situation can be observed in the other fields for example microsoft absolutely the same microsoft is active in classic media 
by co-owning MSNBC. Uh, Microsoft also is owning Microsoft Pay, which is the financial platform. Microsoft is owning Microsoft Education. Microsoft owning their own studios of the content making. And they are also present in some kind of software field for the cars. Apple. Apple is also retaining his own financial platform, Pay, Apple Pay. They is active in field of production of entertaining content, especially with Pixar. But actually, as you know, uh, Apple TV is producing their own movies and series such as Morning News, for example, has been a series which has been uh, produced directly by Apple. And uh, as you know, also Apple is very present in the field of the self-driving cars also. And finally, Google, which is also present in the field of self-driving cars with the project Waymo. Uh, there is also a Google education and Google is very active in the field of education right now with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, also Google Pay, yes, some kind of alternative financial platform. So we can see how big corporations in the field of uh, information companies, information industries, uh, and telecommunication, but especially in device manufacturing and software manufacturing, are becoming more and more present in all fields of our life. They are trying just to mediatize and commodify everything, to, to transform everything into the commodity which can be sold on the market, which can be um, uh, separately, separately commodified, uh, separately commercialized, uh, etc. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, and uh, right now, why uh, I will open the chat and probably to try to react on some of your questions. Mm. Political economy is called mercantilism and it covers all areas of export and import as well as the control commodity cost and inflation. But here I think our topic will be quite narrow and only it is communication on media and it's really a new topic for learning to me. Yes, thank you very much. Um, how do you see the future of media, for example, in 10 years? Uh, I think that in 10 years, everything will be media. Uh, probably except uh, producing children's, uh, but uh, yes, uh, the the platformization will be uh, will be uh, will be going, and especially uh, in ten years, uh, it will be very combined with the narrow industries, with the industry of narrow marketing, with the industry of the uh, narrow communication, so the ability to connect uh, human brain with the computer directly, and we can see a huge investment. Uh, right now, uh, putting into this field, and of course, uh, the, it will be a new era of the new commodification. Because uh, after that, we, we will deal with a commodification of another, absolutely another field, absolutely another um, uh, uh, things. Um, it will control the whole world, which already does. Many countries control it, but still, they are not able to fully control media. Media politics has started. Many countries will not have any physical face-to-face -face war, but may yes, of course, the idea of the so-called hybrid wars is very, very popular right now, especially right now. Yeah, uh, especially after the scandal about the so so-called possible Russian uh, Russian role into American elections of 2016. Yeah. Uh, the technology is rapidly increasing in new innovations year by year. We are human creating. If the technology takes more and more control, will the robots replace human? I don't think so. But the problem is that especially those who produce the algorithms for, for, for robots, the humans who are produced the algorithms for, for, for robots will be the main companies in the world. Actually, it's especially the companies which are producing algorithms and controlling personalized algorithms, or for example, news spreading, such as Facebook, such as Google, etc. Because, as you know, they, they are making secret their algorithms, how finally they distribute you the personalized advertising. Um, uh, this is impossible, I guess. Yeah, this is a kind of discussion in the chat, as we can see. Yeah. 
some people are saying that it's impossible to replace humans. Uh, we are very far from the reality when the robots can replace human as I researched on that topic, especially on uh, artificial, artificial intelligence industry. They say uh, even, the two, even the robots are more intelligent than the human, they still lack in something that human has. Yes, of course they are lacking, but at the same time, we can see a lot of robots able to do it, something which has been unimaginable, I don't know, 10 years ago. Actually, as you know, robots can produce news, actually, uh, because they are news, robot written news. So news can be written by robots and published. Uh, we can see actually the virtual, so the robots, they anchor on a television. We can see actually the music produced by robots. Yeah, robots are able to create music. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it means that it's developing very, very high and uh, it's uh, highly possible that even in creating field, creative field, in 10 years, we will see the robotics very developed. We will see probably robotics as a very uh, developed in field of the creation of content, which has been unimaginable, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, I believe there will be, be some strict regulations that prevent people controlling people because it's kind of violations of human rights. Yes, but you know, take a look on pandemic. You can see that during this pandemic, a lot of governments and even some governments of quite democratic states, very easy, started to, to uh, propose some such kind of things as uh, using the surveillance technologies, uh, technologies of tracing, et cetera, et cetera, in order to control the movements of people. So it means that uh, I think that it's, uh, uh, it means that in a contemporary technological environment, we have deal with a lot of technocratic policy and such technocratic policy creates technocratic politics and technocratic politics sometimes has absolutely no breaks. Yeah, so they can digitalize everything they want, uh, etc. And in this case, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not um, it's not to forget that uh, uh, some uh, governments are using technologies of controlling people without tasking their people. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. What are career opportunities for studying critical media studies? Uh, mainly career opportunities of studying critical media studies. First of all, it's the different kind of analytics in industry also. The problem is, it, is that without critical thinking, you cannot, uh, you cannot analyze the risks or it's quite blurred for you to analyze the risks. So critical thinking helps you to analyze risks. So uh, it means that we we expecting that some of such people will not remain in academia. They will go outside to the analytic, to the think tanks, etc. And you know that actually in the politics in the other fields, the media analytics becomes more and more popular. Yeah, and the familiar with different methods. Uh, uh, of their researching. And a second is, of course, the academic opportunities. So in my opinion, critical media studies is not to prepare someone for the particular industry, is especially to prepare some people thinking, which, uh, which is quite large field, you know, you can think every, everywhere. Yeah? But of course, so we are considering that a large part of such people after the master on critical media studies will affect the doctoral schools and obtain the PhDs. So remain in the academia. Uh, critical media studies lead you toward politics and make you high level politicians as well. Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, especially, you know that some politicians, especially populist politicians are very, very known uh, or are very, very familiar with some you know, critical theories just because they are just doing uh, the things or promoting policies which helps them to 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 obtain this this uh, this part of the, 
of the political political space, let's say. So if you have other if you have some other questions, probably I don't know. Thank you very much. Probably some people can uh -huh. can ask the questions personally. Yeah, it's it's up to them. Any any, any other questions or no? Uh, maybe if you will have any questions, so you can send it to me. I will forward to Professor Elia, or you can contact our education and training advisory center uh, to get consultation. And I think uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, I will send to everybody recording of this session of this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much for the informative session <laughs> in our chat. Uh, okay, and we will have a um, new webinar next Friday. And that's all for today. Have a nice weekend.